Okay, many thanks, Helen and uh, Rick and Karen for the invitation. I suspect that uh, I'll have to preface my uh, presentation with the uh, the disclaimer now for something completely different. So, uh, ESIS Particle uh, um, is a uh, open source software package that uh, has been developed at the University of Queensland and uh, and elsewhere as part of an open source initiative for many many years. Uh, it's basically about modeling crustal deformation processes using physics. Um, and uh, so I'll give you a bit of an overview of the basic concept of the method, uh, as well as uh, an overview of what ESIS particle is. Uh, given the audience, I, I won't go into too much technical detail, just give you a flavor for, for how it works. Uh, and, uh, and then just show some examples from the literature, which I thought may be of interest uh in the context of uh of the uh, uh presentation today so um without further ado physics-based numerical modeling of crustal processes so this is about uh using computers to simulate the physical processes that give rise to the geological structures that we see um in the context of numerical modeling of of physical systems uh geology poses a much bigger challenge than engineering it's far easier to fly the a380 on a supercomputer or uh, real-time optimize the performance of a race car using supercomputers on track at the f1 than it is to try and model um, geological processes so um, the two key ingredients that make it hard from a physics point of view is that it always involves large deformations and or brittle fracture as we can see in this image of an outcrop uh, here in the bottom right there um, the discrete element method is relatively old now from uh, the late 1980s. The idea is that we represent materials like a piece of rock uh, as a whole bunch of little indivisible spheres. We define forces between those spheres and then we apply Newton's laws brute force to uh, determine uh, how those spheres will move around for different kind of loading conditions, different initial geometries, uh, and of course, different rheologies uh, incorporated into the interactions between these individual spheres. Uh, it's computationally very expensive um, and as such generally requires supercomputers to get relatively high uh, fidelity. Uh, so ESA's particle has developed over a long period of time. Uh, it has about a 30 year development history. Uh, and the idea was to take this discrete element method wrap it up in a, a software tool that would make it very easy uh, ultimately for PhD students and postdocs and the like uh, to model the geophysical uh, or crustal processes that they're interested in uh, without having to know about all of the gory detail behind the scenes. Um, so it's, uh, it's a parallel implementation of the discrete element method uh, designed initially for rock breakage and granular media flow associated with geomechanics, but as I'll show later, has been adapted very much in the geosciences to study uh, crustal deformation processes. Uh, I personally have run it to an in excess of 300 million particles on supercomputers. The two movies you will have seen there of slope collapse and hopper flow are, are fairly old now. Uh, some of the first two uh, one million particle simulations ever done with DEM to my knowledge. Uh, we were fortunate to be funded for quite some time by the Australian Federal Government through Access and Allscope, uh, but now we are a volunteer open source initiative and we have uh, developers and users all over the world, uh, roughly 100 different users uh, and about 15 developers have contributed to the code. Um, uh, we, we can do a range of things uh, with different types of interactions and walls and different shaped meshes and, and that sort of thing. Uh, the most important thing is, is that if you just want to use it, you just need to write a very simple Python script. And then there are some post-processing tools to help you visualize the results. Uh, it's free and open source and there's lots of documentation and user support available. All right, six minutes remaining. So parallelism, basically we break up the big model into lots of little smaller models. We give each one to a different CPU and then each CPU does the calculations for that smaller model. And I'll leave it at that. The user interface, as I said, is a Python scripting interface. So you define your simulation. If you like, this is the recipe. I've got a simulation container. I insert particles, I insert walls, I define the interactions and then I tell it to run. Um, 
you then uh, can use the command line uh, to run the simulation, or you can send it off to a supercomputer and have it sit in a queue for a few dozen weeks before it runs. And, uh, and then you finally get your simulation results saved to disk, uh, after which time there are post-processing tools that allow you to bring it into open source visualization packages like Paraview. All right, applications and crustal deformation studies, just to try and keep moving before everyone falls asleep. Uh, none of the work I'm about to present you is my own. Uh, it's all examples from the literature from uh, other users of ESIS particle, uh, but I thought they might uh, tell an interesting story. And, and so I've selected them for today. Uh, it's got nothing to do with uh, what I prefer to do, which is to do uh, extreme violence to rocks on uh, regular occurrences. Um, so the first one is accretionary prisms. Um, so um, there's plenty of geologists in the room, so I won't explain what that is, but the question being uh, asked by uh, uh, Ting Zhang here is how does the basal drag uh, affect uh, the folding and faulting that occurs uh, during uh, formation of accretionary prisms? Uh, so he set up a very simplified model, as you can see up in the top corner there and essentially is squeezing the model uh, and then looking at the fold patterns that ensue for different degrees of basal drag. Um, uh, and uh, from that, we can, we can learn quite a bit about how the rheological properties, in this case, just one of those, the basal drag term, uh, influences the, uh, uh, the structure of the accretionary uh, wedge. Uh, four minutes to go, I think I might have time for questions. Um, so, um, uh, another example, this is out of uh, Janos Urai's uh, uh, endogene uh, 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 geodynamics group at the RWTH Arken, where one of the other lead developers of uh, Stefan Abe of ESIS Particle uh, spent some time. Uh, this is looking at uh, formation of normal faults uh, near, in, in the near surface, in particular, uh, trying to understand the formation of uh, fracture pathways and the porosity that develops in the formation of these near surface uh, faults. Validation was done via sandbox analog type uh, experiments, as you can see here on the right. Uh, and uh, the idea here was, was really to understand how the uh, rheological properties influence the structure and porosity that develops in these normal faulting kind of scenarios. And as you can imagine, that, that has implications for the pathways for geophysical fluids, where they'll mineralize and where they're likely to be found when we come along later. Um, another one which I think is really interesting is uh, work to understand how we can relate uh, structural features like boudinage, as shown in the top right here, uh, how we can relate that to the rheological properties, but also to reconstruct, uh, reconstruct the tectonic stress conditions that gave rise to these structures in the first place in a very quantitative sense. Uh, and boudinage is often used as a marker for stress and strain, uh, but this work in two dimensions, as I'm showing here, and then also in three dimensions, uh, has demonstrated uh, that uh, uh, in fact, uh, you can learn a great deal indeed uh, about the stressing history of a region. In this case, um, we've got uh, stresses that are being applied uh, in multiple different directions and uh, in different sequences and looking at the three-dimensional structure of the uh, boudinage layers that would result uh, and some interesting uh, uh, laboratory experiments for validation purposes where they had hemihydrite on top of a honey uh, substrate that they then squished. Uh, so we're looking down from above in these images uh, for comparison. Uh, and these are the stereo nets showing the major fracture directions. And you can see quite some good similarities there. Um, another one which I thought might be interesting, it comes up quite often around uh, uh, the SMI about what can we infer about uh, veins and the fractures that, that cut across veins turns out it's pretty complicated. Um, so this is my last real slide. Uh, what si uh, Simon Virgo, uh, Stefan and Janos are doing here is looking at how the stressing conditions uh, influence the way that fractures will uh, uh, interact with uh, pre-existing uh, veins or joints in the rock mass. Uh, and uh, I think the, one of the uh, major outcomes in their discussion um, is, is worth a read. So I'll read that to you. 
Second uh, important implication for the reconstruction of deformation phases from structural observations in the field uh, is that often cross-cutting relationships of different vein generations are used to establish relative order of deformation events. Uh, we've shown that the fracture step over mechanism is strongly promoted by uh, the tectonic loading conditions in, in detail in three dimensions. This mechanism produces vein structures that can easily be misinterpreted as shear vein offsets and thus lead to a misinterpretation of the age uh, relationships between veins. And then they go on to caution people. Uh, I won't caution you because I don't really understand all of that as well as you do. Um, that's it for me with two seconds to spare. Happy to take some questions. Cheers.